Well, thank you, Dominique, for that uh, presentation, and thank you for the great work that you're doing. So, so I realized as I was contemplating, now I'm going to introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, that this isn't exactly a feel-good parade of topics. But that's okay, right? Because that's actually what we're about. We're not about rainbows and sunshine. We're about addressing the things that are problematic. And so I'm delighted to introduce uh, our next speaker is Dr. Michelle Carney. I will, as a, I will give a slight uh, tip of the cap to Michelle is our still new director of our School of Social Work. Uh, she comes to us from the University of Georgia. Uh, one of the things that I think is distinctive about Michelle's line of research and activity is that while she's going to speak to you about some of her more social work oriented research, she's also been uh, focused on nonprofit management uh, studies and figuring out how nonprofits that are created to address social issues can be better managed, better run. And so in that sense, she's a perfect fit for our college because as many of you know, our Lodestar Center for Nonprofit Management and, uh, and Philanthropy is a leader in the field. And Michelle works at the intersection of social work and philanthropy. She happens also to be a leading expert on interpersonal violence, and she's going to talk this evening about some of that, some of that research. And so I'm delighted to introduce Michelle Carney from our School of Social Work as well. So many, many years ago, when I was a young undergraduate social work student, um, I read a statistic that said every 30 seconds a woman is assaulted. And I thought, this is tragic. I mean, this is really, really horrible. And I thought, I need to do something about this. This is a problem that I need to engage in. And so I took a field opportunity to work in a night prosecutor program where social work students and law students, no supervisors, worked together to mediate domestic violence cases. It was at night. It was from 6 to 10 o'clock at night. And I felt like we were doing some really good work. What I thought going into that was that this is a pretty simple problem, right? These women are being assaulted by men at a very high rate. Two women every minute are dying from this sort of thing. And I was really, really sort of energized as, a, you know, as an undergraduate student. But what I saw was really a very complex social problem. In the lobby, waiting for these mediation sessions, I saw people being abused. I saw men violently abusing the women that they were there to mediate with. I saw women who were punching and slapping and spitting their, at their male partners. And I thought, this is not as simple as I thought it was. This is a much more complex issue. So I embarked on a very long sort of career of working with battered women and thought that I was really sort of doing some good. Now, we can turn to today, and this is our statistic. So remember, in 1986, it was every 30 seconds. In 2015, it's every nine seconds. So it's incredibly, incredibly, incredibly disappointing. So what we know about the individual is women are assaulted. This is our number. We know that, for example, more women were killed from 2001 to 2012 than casualties in the Afghanistan and Iraq conflicts. That it's happening in the homes, that it's transcending the homes, happening for individuals, and it's transcending individuals to the home. And I spoke with a woman earlier tonight about the children. How are the children affected? And what we know is pretty simply children are affected. So children are being assaulted in these homes. So it's now it's not just about that woman who's being killed by their a partner or assaulted by their partner every nine seconds. It's now about the children that are in that home and what's happening to those children. 60% of the domestic violence happens in the home. So more than 3 million children witness it, see it, experience it in their homes. 10 million children are exposed to it. So what I thought was this sort of simple problem of men hitting women became a much larger issue to me. So it's individual, but it's families, and it's also the community. 
So this is the number of days missed. It's 8 million days in one year. That translates to 32,000 full-time jobs. So I realize this is a really uplifting topic. But what I, what, I, what I began to see and what I think is so important for us to understand is that it's such a complex topic. It's not this simple one person is hitting another person. There are children. There are days lost from work. There's all kinds of things that are happening. When a child grows up in a home where parents are engaging in violence, or not necessarily parents, but the partners in the house, and all of my research has been heterosexual couples. I know there's lots of research out there, same-sex couples. Somebody asked me, why haven't you done that? I simply don't have the time. So that's a big research area. It's really important. And in some ways, you'll see later, it sort of helps um, folks believe in my sort of research when they can think about same-sex same couples engaging in violence. But in heterosexual relationships, that's what I'm talking about. Children are witnessing this sort of violence as problem solving. So they're seeing their, whether, think back to when I was in my beginning, my internship, whether it's you know, someone spitting at the other person or someone hitting the other person, if I'm seeing that as a child in a home, what am I thinking? That's how you solve problems, right? So it leaves the home and it goes out into the community, goes into the schools, and then suddenly we have this public health issue, really, that is about people using violence to solve problems, not problem solving in the way that we would hope folks would do it. And this, to me, is, is just a staggering statistic. If you, if you see that children who witness abuse are a thousand times more likely to abuse as adults, would there be any reason not to try to figure out this social problem? So I'm really passionate about that. So I'll leave it on this pretty little girl. So, so what, what did I decide to do about it? Um, I decided that I had been working with women who were, I know we don't really use the victim language anymore. We, we call them battered women when I was first starting, now we call them survivors, lots of positive things. But I was working with women and what I was seeing was they weren't leaving their, that relationship for a variety of reasons. Mostly financial, sometimes there's children involved, but they're staying in these relationships. So the programming that I was seeing was really saying, um, let's sort of help you, but we know you're gonna stay in this situation. And I began to think, wait a minute, I think we're looking at this the wrong way. So it's really important to help someone sort of thrive in a dysfunctional system, dysfunctional situation if that's what you need to do. But I started thinking, why aren't we working with the batterers? Why aren't we looking at the problem from the perpetrator perspective? So my simple mind thought, if we can stop the abuse, then we can stop the victimization. And so by this point, I'm a young researcher at a university, and as many of you might know, I'm trying to figure out what research agenda I'm really passionate about. And I had an opportunity to go and visit a community-based agency that handled all of the court-mandated batter intervention programming. So thousands of men, primarily men at this time, were being arrested for domestic violence, were being court-mandated into these programs, and I had the opportunity to see if they worked. And I thought, this is perfect, you know? This is great because now I can say, does it work? And if it works, then we can solve this big problem and then we can reduce that 30 second because I didn't yet know the nine second number. So I went into this organization and learned what they were doing, created instruments that measured all kinds of things about violence so that I, my hope was that I could show that across time, people would actually be less violent. So they would use violence less, they'd be less controlling, they'd have um, less opportunity to abuse. So all kinds of fancy psychometric stuff, but, but what we really wanted to see was that at the end of the program, people were less violent. But what we saw was that half of the people were dropping out of the program. So you might say, wait, wait a minute, right? It's court mandated. They have to be there. But the problem is so many jurisdictions didn't have the time, the money, the people to, you know, to go track these folks down. So they would often just wait for them to be rearrested or they would never come back again. I was thought this is horrible, right? So I'm talking to the executive director. I'm like, this is really terrible. You're losing more than half of your people. Um, and then what, what they said to me was nationwide, look at the statistics, about 40 to 65% of these programs lose people. 
So we did a really cool thing where we created a predictive model. We identified who'd be likely to drop out so that the agency could figure that out, flag those people and keep them in. And then we spent the next eight or 10 years evaluating these programs. And one of the things that we began to see, manda ma uh, mandatory arrest laws changed, and we started seeing women arrested. So I started, I started talking about violent women, right? And people started looking at me like I had two heads. Women aren't violent. Women are only violent in retaliation or because they have been abused or because they know the abuse is coming. So it was like they couldn't hear me. And, and what I wasn't saying, I was not saying women were more violent than men. I was simply saying some women are violent and let's get services to these women, right? If we close our eyes to it, it's useless. But I, I got a lot of very angry notes, much like Dominique was mentioning. People didn't like what I was saying. But I really kept saying, there's a gender bias here. We assume that the men, and somebody even gave me a poster once. It was um, two restroom doors. The male one said perpetrator, and the female one said victim. And it was like there was this belief that that's the way it is. And this bias is even, it's in our movies, it's in our television. There's this sort of entrenched thinking around who it's okay to hit and who is allowed to hit who. And, and for me, it's frustrating because this is the reality. So one in four men, and I'm not talking by another man, I'm talking by a heterosexual partner, some kind of domestic violence. One in seven will experience severe domestic violence. Some research suggests that worldwide, 40% of those who experience abuse are men. But there's this real stigma about it. Usually when I give this talk at the end, a student will come up, a male student, will come up and say, I have to talk to you. Nobody's ever talked about this, but this is happening to me. But I can't tell anyone because I'm a big football player and she's really tiny and they say to me, why don't you just stop her? But I've been taught not to hit girls. You know, it's just all of the social norms and things that are sort of, we're all tied up in. But this is the reality. But there's a difference, right? Because there's a size difference. And so we know that men are much stronger than women. So men typically use their size and their strength. Women will typically use a weapon. Makes sense, right? A knife, a gun. Women are not as violent as men. I'm not saying that. Men can be far more violent. But what I am saying is women can be violent. That's simple. That's simple. And so if we don't believe that they can be violent, then we're not getting them the services they need. And as a social worker, that's my primary concern. So if we're talking about solving the social problem of domestic violence, then we have to look at it and forget, forget gender. And anytime I say this, somebody says, well, it's always about gender. And I'll say, I wish we would think that it's not about gender. We can understand gender, and we can do the programming with gender in mind. But if we think every woman is, is a victim and every man is a perpetrator, then, and I've heard this, I've had friends who run shelters, they'll say to me, I have women victimizing other women in my shelter <laughs> because we haven't sort of parsed it out. So I think I'm, it's been such an uplifting talk, I know, but, I, but what I... What is, I'm passionate about, what's important to me, is that we realize that anybody who uses violence, they're not using violence. They're using it for some bad reason. They're using, either using it to control, exert power, in retaliation, angry, whatever, to problem solve. I'm not as concerned about their motivations. I'm more concerned that we can identify treatment and treatment match folks. So that even if I'm just using violence because I'm angry and you've been battering me for 25 years, it's still using violence. And so take the sort of stigma away, take the gender bias away, and just look at the fact that when you match folks with the treatment that they need, they're far more likely to move beyond this way of thinking and to engage in problem solving in a way that's much healthier so that we don't have to look at that or